Welcome back to Arise Prime Time, where we speak to and about the newsmakers around the world. I'm Charles Anyegulu. Now let's continue talking about the game of politics, which Nigeria's massive battalion of politicians play so consummately well with all the trickery and plotting that go with it. Could we see a giant swerve away from all that this time, or is it likely to be business as usual? At the moment, they all seem like crouching tigers, poised to strike out for support. But will it be the old guard or the new breed who will win over the electorate? The catastrophically expensive entry ticket into the political arena. It cost 100 million naira just to purchase the form in one party and nearly half that in another has already ensured that the gates in the two main parties are firmly shut to all but the super rich dominated by older men in a country ravaged by poverty where the majority, younger people, simply can't afford the cost of politics. But with more of the youth carrying the scars of political betrayal and appearing to be more alert to how to use their huge political strength this time whilst assessing the possibility of a third force, are we looking at what could be a transformative army of rebels with a cause, armed with voters' cards in 2023? Well, for deeper political insight, hindsight, and foresight, I'm joined now in the studio by the author, international journalist, and African affairs analyst, Lindsay Barrett, who's written numerous eloquent articles about Nigeria's search for a new leader. And by the journalist, policy strategist, and Arise News analyst, Waziri Adia, who is well known for his illuminating dissection of Nigerian politics. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Indeed. Let me start with you, Lindsay Barrett. Great to see you again. I like your haircut. Um, let's try and dissect the policy proposals of the man that you just heard, Malik Ado Ibrahim, who wants to be president. Did he argue his points cogently in your assessment? I think he did very well to, to articulate the problems that a lot of people feel they have with Nigeria and whether he can convince such people to put their ballot in his name is what is important. I think the system is still covered. It's, it's actually the question is whether those who feel that way are really going to be enough to make a difference. So what will be important is to see, even if he doesn't win, whether he'll make an impact on the vote. That's a very important point. Let me come to you, Waziri Adio, because, I mean, you are, to some extent, as Lindsay is, somebody who has, I mean, looked at this quite critically over a period of time. You heard Malik Ado Ibrahim there, presidential candidate of the YPP. How choppy are the waters for him in terms of his ambition to be president of Nigeria? Well, I listened to him very carefully. Um, he's very eloquent, very articulate. Uh, he spoke to his strengths, um, especially in the area of energy, uh, specifically uh, renewable energy, and also the linkage between that and security. Very articulate, fantastic points, you know, that he made. Uh, but um, how that translates to votes uh, is a different thing. Um, also, given the reality of, 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 of Nigeria's politics, he has a personal name recognition in the sense that he's a prince, mm. right, uh, from, from, from the royal family of Iberia land, the famous Ado Ibrahim. Uh, but um, is that a name recognition that has electoral value? That's a different thing. But talking specifically about his, uh, about his proposals, I find that quite interesting. Uh, you know, especially the, the, the emphasis on, 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 on power. Power is very, very uh, critical, critical to development. Yeah. Um, it's not just that you need power, you know, for, for, to improve quality of life, you know, for the citizens, but you need that to get the economy going. And we all know what that is costing us as a country. Uh, the World Bank uh, earlier in the year released a report that shows that 43% of Nigerians, that's 85 million people, uh, were not connected 
to degrade. Mm. Um, you know, that's more than the population of many countries, right? And also that Nigeria loses, uh, on the average, $26 billion every year for inadequate electricity supply. So Nigeria, despite the potential, despite all the money we'll be spending, despite all the attempts we'll be trying to, 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 to crack this problem, uh, we're, still, uh, we're still not there. And so for somebody who has played in that sector, um, it's, it's important that we listen to you. And one of the things that debates and campaigns do is to throw up ideas, whether the, ca the candidates win or not. Uh, at least the ideas they are throw into yes, the space that, can that people can, practice. yes, yes. And, that, and that's why it's very mm. important for people to campaign. That's why it's very important for debates to happen, you know, and people to see, you know, what, uh, what ideas. So there's a public value mm. in running, whether you win or not. At least you put your idea, you know, into... into that's a very yeah, good point, yeah. especially when most of them say that they're doing it because they want to change Nigeria for the better, not yeah. because of their own personal ambition. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Let me come to you, uh, Lindsay Barrett. There, there appears to be a lot of interest in the youth um, and their thinking sort of politically and all the talk about Peter B and what a vivid, hopeful figure he is. I mean, let's face it, everyone's talking about uh, Peter B. But is it possible that the popular interest in him and others, I suppose, like him, Kwan Kwaso, for instance, even Malik Ado Ibrahim, is going to drain away before voting begins and people will once again be well, driven by the real issues in their lives, which is where their next meal is going to come from and which politician has the deepest pockets, yes. basically. Actually, Charles, the most interesting thing about the present mood of the nation is that for once it seems that politics has become the instrument through which people think there may be change. Mm. And that's a Bef very interesting development. Before isn't it? a lot of people said nothing will change. Mm. I'll vote for this man because I know he is the one who will pay for the vote. But it seems that Nigeria's demography has changed a lot. For one, one of the reasons why Peter Obi has become so popular is not even because of anything he has said, it's because of the way a large segment of Nigeria's electorate view him. Mm. They do feel that politics has been unfair to the southeastern part of the country. And a large population believes that. Even I've heard it said in markets here in the north, I've spoken to young people who told me, I'll vote for him because I think it's about time we gave it to an Igbo man. This little un unsolicited interest that he has brought is very important in the thinking. But is there also a sense of integrity? That, that there is. It doesn't matter who you are, that the, it is time to the, clean up Nigeria. There politics. is uh, that sense. Right. And because Peter Obi has portrayed himself as a man who is very prudent mm. in, and a careful manager, people are thinking of him. And I believe he is going to make an impact. I have said it that if the three front runners are truly the three front runners and Peter Obi enters and comes a good third or maybe even second, we don't know who will be first, mm. that is going to make a difference in Nigeria. Because right. after the election, the reaction of people will be very, very mm. important. It's basically making yeah. it difficult, Waziri Adia, for people to settle for business as usual. But, but let me is. ask you this, because today, um, without focusing too much on one candidate, so that it doesn't look we're so, like we're sort of taking, you know, f sides, um, Peter B and his Labour Party picked their vice presidential candidate, uh, Senator Yusuf Dati Baba Ahmed, who is the founder of Bayes University here in Abuja. What do you think of him? I think he's a good choice. Um, and he ticks uh, all the boxes uh, in many ways. Um, the first thing is that 
uh, if you look at the ticket now, mm. uh, you have two relatively young people, right? Uh, Mr. Obi himself is in his early 60s. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, Senator Baba Ahmed, you know, um, younger than that. Mm. You know, so, so you have, when you compare that with the, uh, with the, with the, with the candidates of, of, of the leading parties, you know, so which also uh, will resonate more uh, to the youth, you know, uh, 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 voters, you know, in this country. So that is one. Two is that he also, it's not just that he's young, uh, he's been around. Mm. Uh, he was a member of the House of Reps. He was voted in the House of Reps in 2003. Uh, he was a member of, uh, of the Senate in 2011. So he also comes with political experience. He comes from the famous Baba Ahmed family of Zaria. Um, you know, and he's, he's, he's also, co uh, compared to what Labour Party had before, which was um, Mr. Peter Obi and Mr. Doyo Kupe, both of them from the South, both of them Christian. So uh, now you have a more balanced uh, ticket. Uh, you have somebody from the South who is Christian, you have somebody from the North who is Muslim, uh, which also um, addresses the issue of the fourth line you know, of, of this country. And he's also an entrepreneur mm. uh, and somebody who has invested in education. Uh, who, so, so it's, it's um, and also somebody who complements Mr. Obi more than what they were trying to do before. Uh, if, because he's younger mm. uh, and he's also a karma person, he's not a very prominent politician like that, uh, it would not be in competition with the candidate of the party if they win. Whereas if they had gone ahead to do the OB Kwan Kwan So ticket, yes, and let's that, say, you know, that, that would have been a disruptive, you know, kind of uh, precedency. Yeah. If you have two people who feel that they are equally qualified mm. to be the number one, and the, the kind of system that we run, the president is the president. What I do not know, though, is that with all these sterling credentials, uh, whether uh, the choice of uh, Mr. Uh, uh, sorry, Senator Dati Ahmed, uh, Baba Ahmed, who can give Labour Party the kind of leverage, the kind of electoral advantage that Kwan Kwaso can give them in the North. Um, we we'll wait to see that. That's a very good point. And um, let me, I, I'm going to come back to that point because I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a further discussion to be had there. But uh, Lindsay Barrett, just listening to Waziri Adia there, what qualities do you reckon that um, Senator Baba Ahmed will bring to the role of vice president, assuming they win? Because as Waziri said, he does seem to have experience. I mean, he's an academic, he's a businessman, he's a founder of a university, he's a former banking officer, which gives him some measure of economic experience. He's chairman of the board of trustees of the, or at least was of the National Youth Service Corps. And of course, a, a former senator and former member of the House of Representatives. Well, the truth is that the OB Baba Ahmed ticket seems like uh, a ticket made somewhere in heaven because actually they're both deeply committed to the new Nigeria. There's no doubt about it. They are relatively young men and they will appeal to a very large cross-section of young Nigerians who are fed up with the old politics. Mm. So I believe they will have a, a large following. Whether that following will be bigger than that of the old-fashioned politicians is something we can't say yet. Because you have to wait till the campaigns really begin to know whether they are able to ginger up support. But truly, it shows me that the Nigerian democracy is bringing out, you know, real leadership from Nigerians. And we are beginning to think about putting together people who genuinely have something to offer. So I think that, that they have been able to come up with a ticket like that is a good sign for the right. future. Okay, I, I said I was going to come back to that point, uh, Waziri. If Peter B and Dati Ahmed 
when, what sort of structure, because you touched on this briefly, what sort of structure does the Labour Party have to support their victory? Will they have seats in the National Assembly? I mean, governors in the states, etc., or will it be like generals without an army? Well, it's, uh, we need to first look at, uh, do they even have candidates? Mm for the positions, you know. Well, that's uh, pretty much the same uh, thing. Because if they in, don't in, have yeah, the candidates, you know, do they, do they're, they're pretty much out at sea. Do they have uh, credible candidates? Mm. Um, and another thing is that, you know, the way our politics works, and I don't think it's peculiar to our politics, is that there's also this bandwagon effect. Uh, if, uh, and we have seen it, we have seen it, uh, uh, we, we saw it uh, in, in, in 2015, uh, we saw it even before then, where if you have a popular a presidential ticket, right? Mm. Um, people would, uh, would just, uh, some people didn't even campaign in some instances uh, where people uh, just voted for them because mm. uh, they wanted to vote the party and they wanted to also make sure that the party is supported in the National Assembly. Um, so, the, 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 interestingly, Labour Party uh, touts itself as the party of the workers. And as we know, the workers are in the majority. But we have not seen that uh, over time since Labour Party was registered as a political party. Uh, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, you cannot, uh, that the fact that you have a Peter O.B. and now uh, with a Baba Ahmed, that that cannot transfer a lot of uh, uh, goodwill. Mm. Uh, you know, for example, Kwan Kwasu just formed his party, and that party is already, you know, catching fire. Uh, in 2011, uh, General Buhari formed CPC. Uh, so sometimes the personality can rub on the party, can rub off on the party. So um, it's, it's, but at the same time, another thing to also look at is that going back to the, to, to the nature of our politics, let's assume that they win and they do not have the majority mm. in, the, in the National Assembly. There are two scenarios there. One is that uh, they might have a tough time and this is where uh, the, the antecedent of Ibaba Ahmed will come in. He had been in the National Assembly, mm. both in the House and the Senate. Uh, but it's also possible that you have people decamping. You know, there's this thing that, you know, the, the heads mentality in our politics that people just want to be in the, on the winning side. You know, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's too early to say. Uh, you mean decamping to the Labour yeah, Party? They, yeah, they yeah. Can, even after winning. Mm. Uh, from, uh, on yes, the basis that, of that, is a, that is a scenario you know, yes, that, is, yes, yes. that potentially yes. could yes. happen, so, given, so given what people happens could, in Nigeria. People could, the bandwagon mm. uh, could, could get Labour candidates elected mm. in the first instance, even if that doesn't happen. If they win, um, the other people can change their party. As we know, people crisscross all Absolutely. the time. Absolutely. You know, so it's, it's, um, it depends on how they handle it. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's good that there's somebody with legislative experience on the ticket, mm. uh, which can, you know, which can, can help. Uh, Absolutely. Because that's going to be any president. Um, you have your own legislative agenda. You have budgets to pass. You have bills to pass, laws to pass, and all of that. And you need the National Assembly. Mm. And having the National Assembly um, uh, on site is, is very important for your agenda. I mean, and absolutely also to crucial. make sure that you don't get impeached. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good point. Yeah. But, but, but what about the other potential drawback, Lindsay, which is the unions who appear to dominate in the Labour Party, or at least are a credible force within the Labour Party. I mean, we're looking at what is happening in Nigeria with, you know, ASU strikes and this, that, or the other thing. I mean, we, we saw the way Margaret Thatcher fought the unions. Otherwise, her, her prime ministership would have been crippled completely. Right. I mean, you know, is that at odds with a, a modern president who's a capitalist and who's trying to sort of develop an economy and modernize and and you know allow free enterprise and all the rest well, of it the truth is that right now peter obi is a new phenomenon in the labor party mm. he wasn't in the labor party he joined the Labour Party in anger. Yeah, so, so, so maybe ideologically, so he doesn't actually, he, he's not on the same and, page. And Labour has not actually established itself as the party of the workers. Mm. Frankly, Labour Party has been a convenient spot for people. It, because it has followership from the unions, um, from the Labour movement, it has been substantial enough to help people 
who are in a problem in one party or the other. One of the important things I think we should note is that given the security problems we have in Nigeria at the moment, what is very important for us to think about is whether there's going to be an election at all, whether security is going to be yeah. taken care security of. Security is a big issue, no you know, question about that. And, and right now, the, the party that is in power mm. is itself facing the problems of trying to um, cure the ills of the nation. So I think, I think my, the previous speaker is correct in that it depends on how we are able to handle the, 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 the post-election thing. My belief is that at this moment, if the election was run tomorrow, Peter Obi may not win, but would make such an impact that whosoever comes to power will need to settle him somehow. <laughs> you know? That term, settle. <laughs> so what we are looking at right now is a country that is being cured mm. of certain ills by whatever happens. There's a dialectical the process and taking we're place. Watching, we're right. watching. We can't say yet what the future right. was. And you, know, you mentioned the current government, which for all intents and purposes is still in power and yes. still has to deal with the issues yes. of the day and still has to deal with what it's done in the last seven years. Uh, you and I were talking about this um, when we spoke on the telephone, looking back at the record of President Buhari, it may not seem as relevant now because everybody's focused on, on the sort of the people coming, potentially coming in. But looking back at his record, he was quite popular when he got in, wasn't he? I mean, when you look at, we're talking about Peter B and Kwanso and all the rest of them, who seem fairly populist and popular. But, but uh, when Buhari got in, he was popular. But since then, a lot of flaws have been criticized. Um, did he actually have any great moments in his presidency, would you say? I mean, are there any that you can point to in the last seven and a half odd years? I'll say so. Uh, I'll say yes. Uh, but before I, I get there, the first thing I need to say is that, um, you know, it's, it's usually different from the outside. Mm. Um, you know, and a famous American politician, Maro Cuomo, said, we campaign in poetry, we govern in prose. Um, so it's, you know, it's very easy for anybody to say, oh, we're going to do this. I'm going to fix power. I'm going mm. to fix security. I'm going to create jobs. Um, the real task is getting those things done. And when you also mix that uh, with um, the hands that you are dealt with and all of that. But I would say that I think, I think uh, there are some significant things that the present administration you know, has done. And we should give them credit for that, uh, for those things. The same way, we should also acknowledge the areas where they have shortcomings. In terms of um, the, the good things that, uh, that you should credit them for, um, in terms of investment in infrastructure, right? Um, I don't know any government in recent uh, history that has done so much in terms of investment in infrastructure in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can look at that in different ways, including completing what others started. Uh, the, 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 the Abuja Kaduna Rail was started uh, by the previous administrations. They completed it. The Wari Itakpe uh, Rail Line was started in 1987-1989. It was completed by this administration. The Badon, Lagos Ibadan Rail was started from scratch. You know, and there are so many things. There are so many projects, so many roads, so many bridges, so many pot stuff going on. Right. Uh, of course, there are people who are saying, "Oh, is this infrastructure we want to do? What can we eat the road?" Uh, but it's very important. Um, infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, is very critical to job creation, to development, to growth, you know, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that is one. If you also look at some key legislations that have been passed under this administration, uh, we should also give them credit for that. You know. Um, the, 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 oil, uh, the petroleum industry bill, for example, uh, was first introduced in parliament uh, in 2008. 
and he went through different iterations and it was almost it was always a stillborn and this administration started it and and got it done uh, there are other things like that too so um but i would say that there are also some issues mm. uh that we need to to ask ourselves uh that you know the administration could have done better uh, let me give you an example that also has become a major problem for us now, the issue of subsidy. The issue of subsidy. Petroleum subsidy, for the first time in the history of this country, the citizens were ready, the government was not ready. For the first time in the history of this country, uh, the, the, price, the pump price of petroleum products um, was increased and there was no protest, nothing whatsoever, right? And we, 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 instead of pursuing popular uh, regular deregulation, we allow the ball to drop. And now we are at a stage now where we are spending 20% of our current budget mm. and possibly more on subsidy, right? Where what we are spending on subsidy is three times the earnings from oil from last year. So it, it's become a, a major problem, and of course, you know, um, the, the security situation we have, you know, back and forth and all of that. And there are also some things like debt, um, you know, uh, growing out of, out of you know, um, um, debt profile, debt I mean, profile right. increasing, right. Uh, 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 and I, so many other things around the economy, mm. you know, that have become, you know, really, um, we're spending. So a lot of those about things negate it, the positive things. That not necessarily. That you, you, you take, you you take it, it in equal measure, you right. know, and government is a continuum. Mm. Um, uh, what we should do is to have, you know, a compressive view. Mm. These are the good things that they have done. These are the areas that, you know, can be improved But the on. big debt yeah. that's going to be hanging over the new government, is that likely to hamstring them when they come in? Well, definitely. There is absolutely no doubt that the debt profile of Nigeria is going to be a major issue for whoever mm. comes in, whether the ruling group continue or not. Or a new person comes but, in. Um, I, I think if you listen to the campaigns, most of the candidates are aware of this and are preparing to handle it. But as he rightly said, the development in rail infrastructure is quite an important development because since independence, we've never seen a government expand rail services. Mm. This government has done it, but they've gotten away with doing some good and a lot of ignoring a lot of things. Um, the, the issue of facing the legacy of this government is actually going to work against their continuation to right. my belief. I believe that the popular feeling is that you have to cure what you are getting. Mm. And that is going to have something to do with the result of the elections. Right. And, and looking at that first draft of history, Waziri, of Buhari's time as president, and as we assess whether it's going to be ugly or handsome, um, is history also likely to be unkind to him and his government in terms of his personal conduct in office, being detached and remote from the people, not being, or at least being perceived as not being empathetic, associated with ethnic injustice and sowing divisions in a country that is so precariously balanced with so many ethnic groups, or is that judging him too harshly? Well, you know, with history, uh, you, can't, you can't say. Um, we have to wait. Um, that is not to say that I agree with everything that you have said in characterizing him. Uh, people come in different ways. There are presidents that are very expressive, there are presidents that are taciturn, um, and all of that, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, we have to wait for, 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 for the judgment of history uh, to see, but, you know, at the same time, um, I'm sure that uh, the president still has, you know, uh, more than close to a year to go, and some of the, even some of the issues that, that are on top of people's mind now, like security or insecurity, 
um, some of those things, there might be some improvement uh, before before like before what, they what we saw before Jonathan left. I yeah. mean, there was a sudden flurry of activity, and you know there was some transform transformation that took some change that took place, but not enough to get people to kind of you know give him uh, give him their votes basically. Yeah, but you know, also talking about history, people look at things in comparative sense. You know, um, who are you comparing whom with? You know, mm -hmm. so. Uh, it's too early to say, but, right. but you know, like every administration, um, it has its strengths and some areas where it could have done, you know, much better. Right. Okay. Yeah. I want to thank you, gentlemen, very much indeed. Absolutely brilliant discussion. Waziri Adio, uh, who is a journalist, policy strategist and a Rise News analyst, and of course, Lindsay Barrett, who's an international journalist, author and African affairs analyst. Thank you very much indeed. That's it for this edition of Arise Primetime. Join us again in the next few days for me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.